Hi, Joe. Hi, Michael. I have something that you might like or something that might make you hate me. <laughs> OK. Um, it's a website that I'm going to share with you uh -huh. that allows you to run Python code within LaTeX documents. OK. Um, I just found it a, a couple of days ago, and I, I wanted to share it with you first um, before before I mention anything. So take a look at it. It's uh, It seemed very interesting. Yeah, Python tech has been around for a while. Oh, OK. Cool. Uh, I've, I've, uh, I've experimented with it and uh, it seems to work just fine. Excellent. Excellent. I'm glad, I'm glad it's not new for you. Um, I have started creating a, um, a list of examples for Python, uh, using Jupyter notebook. I have a CoCalc account that I use uh -huh. and a, um, Glow script account, so I'm gonna I'm gonna teach them the numerical and then show them the visual. Hopefully, once I learn what what, what you're gonna show us today and right. st start in including those as part of um, lecture and uh, assignments and all of that. So I am I am super excited to be here and, and hopefully learn. Well, many, many I'm a little paranoid things. today because I uh, the the 2021 version of Tech Live was released early today and I, I downloaded what I thought was the new version and it turned out that the servers the mirrors had not all updated and uh, I actually downloaded the previous version and installed it and overwrote a year's worth of stuff oh no <laughs> so I've been sitting here for an hour uh re-updating the old stuff just to get the my my current systems here uh back into working order the good news is nothing has changed on overleaf so everything nice. should yeah. should work just fine but i kind of panicked around lunchtime because i <laughs> i had really screwed myself up at that point but uh everything one, seems one of the fine. joys of open source right <laughs> i'm telling you and you know latex a lot of people don't realize that latex and and, and all of that is now mostly based in europe most all of the developers are in europe and so when there are new distributions, uh, you've got to take time zones into account and yeah, you've got to yeah. give uh, server mirrors time to, uh, to upgrade. So hopefully over the weekend, everything will, will be stabilized and I can upgrade for real then, but. Hi, Tony. Hola, am I too early? No, no. It's never too early. Just, never just too uh, early. Okay. Uh, cool. I, I think you got the um, the notification that this is being recorded already. Yeah. When yeah, you and I'm very unhappy about it. I know. Yeah. <laughs> Somebody has to be. So I'm glad you're the first one. I've had three requests for the recording already. So may, maybe. Uh, Having it on a hot, it, it's a holiday Friday in California. It's it's our mid semester break or what we call Good Friday break. Uh -huh. Do you get a break? We don't. It, in, only the Friday in Riverside. We don't. You guys are more advanced than we are. Wow. Just, yeah. I was almost saying like California. We don't get that. We only get says the Chavez Day. Oh yeah. We we don't we don't have our spring break till next week though. So. Um, I don't know how you guys do that, but our spring break is uh, the week of the fifteenth. Uh, I mean, fifteenth is Thursday, so yeah. So you guys are after us then. The week of the twelfth, I guess, going on. Yeah, yeah. Oh, so wow. the, we're the same. Hmm. Fantastic. Yeah. But I'm I'm glad you were able to join us because I know you sent me an email saying. Yeah, know, I was really to... interested in it. Uh, uh, Joe and I have chatted a little bit on Twitter about it. <laughs> uh, I apologize if I keep looking, but I, I am running a class at the same time. So, oh, are you? In case any of my students pop in and need help, so I might mute myself. Well, I got a lot of uh, student frustration this past week. We've got about 
five or six weeks left in the semester. And some have just now realized, oh gosh, I need to actually start writing some problems up. And so <laughs> they've been taking their frustration out on me. So today I held a one hour LaTeX help session and exactly zero students showed up. <laughs> All you can do is offer, right? And uh, so, yeah, I'll, I told them I will do another one next week, but uh, I sat here like the Maytag repairman for an hour. So, and nobody showed up, so. I don't have that model, me tag. <laughs> I tell you, I do. And uh, it's about the only appliance in my house that hasn't had to be replaced at this point. So I'm grateful that I splurged and got those back in the 90s. Wow. So apparently they last forever. Joseph? Uh, yeah, go ahead. Joe, I was just going to ask you, would you rather be a co-host as well? Or um, since you're going to be talking most of the time, do you want us to, to um, I made Tony co-host, that way we can take a that, look at that the would chat be nice. room and yeah. all of that. I'm going to need to share lots of different screens. Uh, so whatever you can do to bless me with that, uh, with that capability. Cool. Okay. I like so, the idea of blessing. <laughs> I, I, I seem like I have the power now. You have lots of power. <laughs> the power to bless with co-host privileges. <laughs> Goodness. Isn't there a Unix command called bless that does something like that? I, I there probably is. I am, my I, Unix am, days. I am very Unix literate. I, I, I know I have a terminal window in my Mac, but I, I visit it only if I have the code that I have to copy and paste. <laughs> and let's see. Um, okay. So let me see if I can share my screen here. Sure. Um, so there's Overleaf. I already have. Um, and this is GitHub. And this is GlowScript. Perfect. And I also have, uh, let's see, in a different application, I have the problem we're going to do. And that's just a screenshot. I'll, I'll put that in the chat window as, as well. It's just a, a PNG graphic. Okay. Um, in fact, let me, let, me, let me do that now just to make sure that that works. Preview. Okay, that should be in the chat window now. I see. Are we going to have to do homework or is this what you're going to demonstrate? <laughs> this is what we're going to do. Uh, we're actually going to do it in real time. Excellent. Uh, and uh, depending on, you know, time constraints, I don't, I don't, I doubt that we'll do all of these because it's got what ABCD, it's got seven parts. Um, I think I scheduled the meeting for an hour and a half, but I think okay. I can keep it running as late as we need to, if we want. Okay. okay. So this is the second one I've hosted and the first one seemed to last a, a good 40 minutes over the allotted time. <laughs> You're muted, Tony. I don't think I had anything special to say. Oh. <laughs> I was just saying that meetings last depending on how much conversation is yeah. there. Last time we had a lot of conversation, uh, yeah. I think in the standard based ones, which yeah. was good. So there's a- there's That was a an excellent mix. topic, yeah. yeah. There's a happy mix between 20-ish people and a lot of conversation. If you go to 40, Probably not as much. Yeah. Speaking of standards-based grading, uh, I found this on Twitter. 
I'll post the link over here in the chat box. I found this on Twitter earlier today. A link to an article on um, getting rid of traditional transcripts and okay. uh, traditional grades. I thought it was a pretty interesting read. I think um, there is a UC, a University of California, um, that, that has not used the normal grades um, in a while. Uh, University of California at Santa Barbara, I believe. Oh, okay. um, They have the pass-fail method for a lot of their courses. Uh, there's, a, there's a college in Florida. I think their name is literally New College. I think that's it. And, and they do a similar thing. They don't issue transcripts. They issue uh, portfolio-like listings of what their students have accomplished. Now, I know Tony uses Canvas. What, what's your uh, course management system, Joe? Uh, we're, we're forced into Blackboard. Blackboard. <laughs> And I think the devil designed it because it's just not intuitive. <laughs> but I, I get by with it. I'm, I'm quite pleasantly surprised with Canvas. Our college was the last one in California to switch to it. Hmm. We had Blackboard as well. And I, I did not use Blackboard at all to the point where I, I ran my own Moodle server <laughs> and, and I linked wish to it. I wish we had the option to, to use Moodle. Uh, I, I would like to experiment with it. I've heard some really good things about it. Yeah. I've heard good things about Canvas too. Canvas is, I, I like Canvas. Um, it's, I've been using it for a year and a half now and it's been very, very logical, friendly to use, easy to learn relatively compared to Blackboard, definitely. Hello, Francette. Welcome. I don't know if you can hear me yet or not. A meeting of Francette. <laughs> Welcome. Is that really a back the background of where you are, or is that a image? No. <laughs> You're muted, Francette, sorry. Still muted, okay. I can, I'm having a hard time with my mute button in uh, Zoom lately. I I have to click it like five times before it unmutes me. Yeah, it, and it, it's the Zoom account that we have is associated with the school and we don't have administrative rights to um, allow people to unmute upon entry. It's set to so that whenever I'm hosting something, automatically everybody is is admitted as muted. It actually makes sense <clears throat> that everybody is muted. But this this problem just started with me a couple of days ago. I, I started in meetings, and all of a sudden, I just can't seem to get the unmute button to click. And I reboot up my computer, so I know that's not the issue. <laughs> so, I, I don't know if you guys are aware, sorry to interrupt you, but um, if you hit the space bar, sometimes it mutes and unmutes. And for the longest time, I was leaning on my space bar without knowing during a meeting. Um, and I, I was going on like crazy. And then somebody, I kept seeing this. And then finally somebody said, you're muted. <laughs> oh, maybe that's what I'm doing as I'm hitting the mute button, I'm hitting the space bar at the same time because I am reaching across. So that would make sense. I'll pay yeah. attention to that. Thank you. Hi, Carrie. Welcome for joining us. Thank you for joining Hello. us. Hi, Hi, Jason. Thank you for joining us. Um, Joe, I'll leave it up to you. Normally, if, if um, we, we wait a couple of minutes, just in case people have other Zoom meetings that run till one. That's fine. Uh, and then maybe we can start maybe 105, 102. I want to be respectful okay. of, of your time as well. Okay. Nothing else to do this afternoon. <laughs> 
I've got to host an astronomy club meeting later tonight, but other than that. Uh, my wife and I were going to take a seven hour drive up to Northern California to visit my sister, but we decided we'll just wake up early tomorrow and do it instead. So I have nothing for the rest of the day. Hi, David. Welcome. I'm actually going to go outside tonight and try to see uh, the asteroid Vesta oh. in constellation of Leo. It's sixth, seventh magnitude now. It should be easy in binoculars. Oh, my um, colleague, I think it was about two weeks ago, he, he took a picture with, of Vesta. He was able to catch it when it was in the Hyades. It was pretty awesome. I'm pretty sure it was Vesta that uh, I used when I did when I took uh, observational astronomy back in 89 ish 88 or 89 my my project for that class was to uh, calculate its orbital elements and it was kind of funny because none of my professors knew how to do that so they didn't know if my results were right or not so <laughs> I got an A on it <laughs> I remember Michael Gregg looking at it going, yeah, look, if it ain't magnetic fields, I don't know. So fine, you did fine with it. So, okay, whatever. <laughs> Take the end. Hello, Glenda, welcome. Hello, hello, hello. You've been Simpsonized. It's been a few years since I got <laughs> My husband's a fan of Simpsons, Simpsons everywhere. One of my backgrounds is the uh, family guy kitchen. Speaking of Simpsons, here comes Bart. <laughs> Good timing. Hi, Bart. Welcome. Hello. We were just talking about The Simpsons and, and you popped in. So. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. Exactly. <laughs> Don't have a cow, dude. <laughs> I never heard that when I was growing up. Yeah. <laughs> Happy Easter, everyone. Well, Same to you. Yeah. Yep. Same to you. Do you guys know if you're open for fall on campus yet or not? Does anybody know? Yeah. Um, we're told we that's the plan. Open. We've made the decision. They're allowing uh, instructors who have labs to make their own decision if they want to be on campus <laughs> or not. But otherwise, um, we are not going back to campus. Yeah, we haven't received the final word yet. Chances are they're going to expand the offerings on campus, but we haven't had a final say on who's coming back and who's not yet. Our hope is that they will allow lab classes, performing classes, and yeah. what they're calling uh, critical sector in California to come back. <laughs> <laughs> um, we're, we decided because we have um, physics kits, we're just going to stay online. Um, we've got a We've got a good rhythm going and we don't want to go on campus and then have them tell us three or four weeks into the semester guess what you got to go back online we're just going to keep it simple that's my fear as well that, yeah, that, that so, would be so devastating i think to, oh to, it's just too much stress to do that so for physics we chose we'll, we'll our entire department is just going to stay online okay. and in the winter the school is keeping their fingers crossed that the entire school will go back to the campus um, I'm not so sure the way things are going lately that I'm as hopeful. <laughs> I'm trying to be optimistic, but I think being a pessimist is <laughs> a little better right now. Hi, John. Welcome. Uh, according to my watch, it's a couple of minutes after. You're welcome. Um, I, I think the protocol is we wait a couple of minutes before we start. Um, I'm okay if we if no objections waiting a couple of more minutes otherwise we can we can have joe start i am actually very excited to hear this i i'm looking I forward to why, i'm usually not nervous before a talk but i'm, I'm kind oh, of oh, i can tell you why i'm excited I, I wanted to sign up for the workshop when the uh, aapt conference and i missed it because i had i had registered for a different workshop so it's it's been almost over a year that I've been trying to see this workshop. So 
<laughs> well, I've learned a lot since then, and I, I, I think I kind of know what I'm doing now. So oh. assuming it's just been one of those strange weeks. So assuming there are no pet glitches, I, I think I think we'll be fine. <laughs> Are they requiring vaccinations for faculty on your campuses? Our president said it's optional for us. Um, I haven't heard. Okay, yeah. I've I've had one shot. I go back on the 23rd for my second one. A student told me that she saw a sign that said, if you have been fully vaccinated, you're not required to wear a mask. No, that's not the case at our college. No, I don't, you know, that might just have been in, in her building. Uh, she's in a different building from me, but uh, otherwise I haven't heard. I hope that's not the case. <laughs> Our campus is actually a vaccination site. So yep. they started um, saying the employees could get vaccinated uh, uh, a few weeks ago. I, so. I got an email from my um, primary care provider that said I'm eligible because I, I'm an educator. So Took, took to the online and uh, booked the first available <laughs> <laughs> appointment. I got I've my... Been slow. Go ahead. No, I've been slow about getting the appointment because I still can't go anywhere, even if I'm vaccinated. So I'm like, well, I'll get it. <laughs> <I'm> not... <laughs> if somebody else feels it's more urgent, they can go ahead and grab it and I'll get mine when I have to. Yeah, we, we thought we were going to wait, but our, our president sent an email saying they're bringing back counselors and librarians on May 10th. So chances are um, lab classes will be the next logical step. So we, I wanted to make sure that, that if we come back, um, I'm vaccinated for it. I think um, we can go ahead and start. Welcome everybody. Um, as you may have seen when you joined that this is gonna be recorded, is being recorded. I will send the uh, taping to Glenda and Tom. I hope that's still the, the same <laughs> procedure so that it's on the website and YouTube channel before too long. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce Joe Hefner, who's gonna talk to us about uh, incorporating LaTeX and GlowScript into our um, courses. I, I don't think, I think I said introductory in the, um, in the uh, description, but I think you can you can find this uh, useful for any of your courses. There was one correction needed. The GlowScript extension should be .org, not .com. I think the last email I sent had that correction once we, we caught it, thanks to an email response. So um, if you need any of those websites, um, please uh, put them in the chat. Uh, that you need them and I'll, I'll copy and paste them in for you if you don't know, but it's overleaf.com and glowscript.org are the two websites that, that Joe is going to talk to us about today. All right, it's all you, Joe. Well, thank you. And uh, I appreciate the uh, opportunity to uh, present on this topic. This is sort of a passion of mine. And uh, I really think it's, uh, I really think it's setting a new uh, I'm, I'm going to be rather, I, I, I think it's setting a new standard. I, I think it's a new way of doing things. And uh, the feedback I've gotten from my students has been very positive. So I'm going to demonstrate uh, this new workflow that uh, my students use now for presenting their work. And uh, first of all, over in the chat box, I just posted a uh, screenshot that is the physics problem that we are going to do today. We are actually going to do a physics problem in real time. And we're going to uh, <laughs> a look of panic and some eyes there. It's OK. Uh, it's a typical uh, gravitational force type of problem. It's out of uh, chapter three of matter and interaction. Uh, it has seven parts. And I'm not going to guarantee that we're going to get to all seven parts, OK? Uh, but we're going to do them one, one part at a time. So, and also let me just warn you that uh, I am going to do this in a much faster way today than I would with my students. Uh, 
So this is going to be a bit like uh, baptism by fire. Uh, but uh, please, 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 if any, if, if there are any questions along the way, if I start going too fast, please just let me know and, uh, and I will slow down. Now, I also need to warn you about one thing. There are several one-time setup steps that must be done here, okay? But once we get the initial setup done, that's it. The rest is very straightforward after that. So let's just get started here. So I'm going to share my screen here, and I'm using Chrome. I'm, I'm, I'm using Chrome more and more these days for, for various reasons. Uh, but this is uh, Overleaf, and if you uh, get into your free Overleaf account, you will be taken to a, a, a landing page that looks something like this. I believe they refer to this as your dashboard. And in your dashboard, you have uh, folders that Overleaf calls projects, okay? So uh, the first thing I would like you to do is to create a brand new project called Mandy 300. And uh, when you do this, uh, it will create one file inside your project and I believe it will be called main.tech. Now you may see that I'm deleting files here, and that's because I'm going to uh, I'm going to go through this setup process with you. But go ahead and create that project, and if I'm not mistaken, it will have one file called main.tech in it. And if you want to, you can delete that file. Uh, yes, blank project, and uh, and there's really nothing magical about the name Mandy 300. It's just the name that I chose because the version of Mandy that you all are seeing today is brand new. It hasn't yet been released into the wild, and it's 3.0.0, so that's why I named it that way. Okay, now... We need to do something else. We need to go to GitHub, and I'm going to put the GitHub address over here in the chat. Okay, so Mandy lives on GitHub, and I'm 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 pretty excited over the fact that last summer I finally learned how to use GitHub, and now I don't see how I got along without it. Uh, so this is the official homepage for the Mandy project now. And there are like 15 or 16 files here. All you need is this zip file right here, overleafproject.zip. And if you click on that, you will go to a page that looks like this. And there is a download button over here on the right. So all you have to do is click that download button and your uh, computer well, hopefully, now it turns out that uh, Chrome is being uh, problematic here. It doesn't like uh, multiple downloads from the same uh, place for some reason. So anyway, so grab that zip file. And now if you're on a Mac, uh, you know that uh, your browsers download things to your downloads folder. If you're on a Windows machine, you're on your own because I haven't used a Windows machine for going on 20 years now. And I don't know where things are stored uh, on a Windows machine. But you should now have a file called overleaf template or overleaf project uh, .zip. And what I need you to do next is to open uh, that file. And I'm just going to, uh, I'm going to copy it from another directory here. And when you open it on a Mac, uh, it will create a new folder with the same name. And inside that folder, 
you're going to find four files. Okay. And uh, what we're going to do next is we are going to upload these four files into your newly created Overleaf project. Now, there's a very slick way to do this. So let me show you. If you're in your Overleaf project, so let me go back out. So here's my dashboard. Here's my blank project. Right there is a little icon that says, or if you hover over it, it says upload. And I'm going to click that. And basically, this is a palette that you can drag those files onto, and you can upload them all four at once. So I'm going to say select from computer. I'm going to go, oh, look at that. It went to my downloads folder automatically. I've, I've rehearsed this about three times today already. And uh, I'm just going to highlight those four files. And I'm going to say open and boom. It almost happens faster than you can can see. Now, that PDF file is important because it's the documentation. Keep a copy of that on your local computer because Overleaf will not let you view that PDF file online. Apparently, it's a security risk of some sort. Okay. Now, most of the setup is done. That was the hardest step in the setup right there. Okay. And uh, before I go to the next little step here, I'm, I'm just going to wait 30 seconds or so uh, just to make sure that everybody is, is at the same place. I usually tell my students, give me a thumbs up if you're, if you're ready to go uh, <laughs> because they tend to keep their cams off and I can't see them. Uh, okay. And uh, if, if you're having an issue, please feel free to ask a question. I uh, can't guarantee that I'll know the answer, but uh, I'll do my best. I'll, I'll be uh, monitoring the chat along with Tony to help okay. out with, with any uh, questions that we see on there, Joe, okay. uh, while you're sharing and we'll bring sure. it to your attention. Sure. No problem. <clears throat> I think if you're creating a new free account on Overleaf, I think they will want to send you uh, an email verification, I guess, to uh, 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 verify that you're not a bot creating an automated account. Uh, all right. Now, I'm still inside my empty project, and we need to do a little bit of configuring here. So we're going to come up here and we're going to click on the word menu. And there are a couple of things that really must be uh, set here. Under compiler, I need you to make sure that Lua LaTeX is selected. Uh, there, are very, there are different uh, LaTeX, in, uh, different tech engines loosely referred to as compilers, even though they're strictly speaking not compilers. It is very important that we have Lua LaTeX selected. I'm not going to go into the technical details for why, uh, but the new version of Mandy is designed to require the Lua LaTeX engine. Make sure the Tech Live version is set to 2020, and that is important. Uh, because Overleaf updates their tech distribution every year. And there will come a day when that little setup step that we had to go through will not be necessary. Once I get the uh, new version of Mandy distributed to the uh, CTAN servers, uh, every tech user on the planet will automatically have it. And so this, this setup uh, will not be uh, necessary. And then one last thing, every project must have a main document. And so select that .tech file as your main document. How do you get to the menu being displayed? You click on the word menu right here from inside your project. And I stole the word automatically from Steve Jobs. 
that's where I got that word. <laughs> and then you can click anywhere else to dismiss that. Now, there are many other options that can be set here. For example, you can set your editor theme. If you like uh, Vim or VI key bindings, you can turn those on. You can select the font. You can select the font size. I tend to like small fonts. So if you have difficulty seeing uh, my source code in just a few minutes, you can tell me and I can make the font bigger. Uh, you can select internal or external PDF viewers. There's a hot key menu uh, that you can pull up like this. It's a very rich editing environment, uh, but I'm not going to focus on that right now. So feel free to experiment with that. Okay, now we're about to compile our very first document. So here's what you do. Make sure that that file right there is highlighted. And I'm going to explain that strange name. There's, there's, a, there's a naming convention that I use in my classes. And I will explain that in just a moment. So now you should have a two pane window. On the left hand side, you have your source code. And please don't let all that source code frighten you. I swear to you, this is going to be so simple. <laughs> and over here on the right, that is a PDF viewer. And so we're going to come up here and we're going to click recompile. And it's going to take a minute because Lua LaTeX is a, well, okay, that went, that actually went pretty fast. So uh, depending on the server load and so forth, this should eventually appear in your uh, right-hand side window. Now, this is a standard PDF file, okay? It's, it's a good old PDF file. The color indicates a live link, okay? So just click on that and notice that it will take you to a very nicely formatted GlowScript program at the end of the document. Now, here's the very coolest thing. And I'm going to say that about every feature that I show you. Everything that I show you is the coolest. If you click anywhere in that gray box, a new tab will open up and you will be taken to GlowScript where you can see this program and you can look at the code. Okay. Now that is a read only link. That is a read only link. So you can't alter this code, but you can run it. Okay. So this is how students, just a, a little foreshadowing here. This is how students uh, submit their codes to me. And I'm gonna show you how to do this. I'm gonna show you how to do this. Okay. So, we're back here in our, our source document. Uh, and so now I'm going to show you how we do this uh, in the context of working a physics problem. So I see, I see Jason has a question there. Uh, do not try to compile mandyexp.sty. Those files will not compile. It's got to be the file with the .tech extension. The STY files, those are the magic files that make everything I'm showing you happen. Those are the source code files. And you're free to look at them, but there's no documentation whatsoever. It's just the raw source code. And I'm afraid it will scare you if you look at it. <laughs> but don't look at it. Okay. <laughs> but the STY files, that's the source code. Okay. Uh, let's see, somebody is asking for the GitHub. Well, oh, okay, I just uploaded the zip file by mistake there. The GitHub is right here. Oh, okay, there it is. Tony put it in. Just send it, yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay, so if you get this nice little PDF file here, the setup is done and the setup is a one one shot thing. And now we are ready to do some physics. So again, I'm just going to pause here for a few seconds to make sure that uh, everybody is in 
uh, in the same place. If you're having problems, please let me know. Uh, Jason, did you did you get your situation straightened out there? No, no, it's not working. I had clicked on that file you recommended and it started to show something like you have there with the assignment title and my name. Uh -huh. Then it disappeared and there's a red screen. Okay. Do you have, you see this green button here that says recompile? Yep. Hit that button. Yeah, I did that quite a few and times. <laughs> no difference. Okay. If you want to share your screen, I can, I can look at your screen. Uh, uh, otherwise, I really don't know what to tell you. So I can stop sharing my screen. Uh, one of the, let's see. Oh, there you go. Okay. Your LaTeX code. Oh, okay. Uh, you have multiple copies of files there. That's what those ones in the, in the brackets there mean. So here's what I'm going to recommend you do. I'm going to recommend you delete everything in that folder and re-upload okay. those four files from the zip file. Okay. Okay. All right. Thanks. And if and if that still doesn't work, uh, let me know. Okay. Are y'all ready to do some physics? So, so that's what we're gonna, that's, that's where we're going with all this. Okay, over in the chat box, I posted uh, a physics problem and I'm just going to, uh, I'm gonna share that particular screen here. Here's the problem, okay? And I will go to the chat box here and I will once again, uh, I'll post this little screenshot. It'll take me just a couple seconds here to pull it up. And um, and this is a problem out of matter and interactions. Um, okay, there it is. It should be in the chat box now. And I, I took this with the Mac uh, screenshot utility. So it is a graphics file. It's a PNG file. Um, So that's the problem we're going to do, okay? And I'm going to, is it okay for me to take this uh, view away? Okay. And now I'm gonna go back to Chrome, okay. Now, we don't use calculators in my class anymore. We have deprecated calculators. This is the 21st century after all. So I tell my students that from now on, all calculational type things are to be done in GlowScript. So I'm now going to switch over to GlowScript. And if you have uh, your account set up there, Please, uh, please log in. And uh, I believe you can use your Google credentials or you can create your own credentials. Uh, when you get inside of uh, GlowScript, uh, there is a default folder structure, but you can create your own folders. So I have a folder that I call solutions, and you can probably guess what I store in that folder. And you can see that uh, there is a system to my naming here. So what we're going to do first is we're going to create, first of all, make sure that this over here is public. That's actually a toggle. You can toggle between private and public. You're going to want to make sure that it displays public because that's how you access a read-only view of the program listing from another source. So make sure you set your, uh, your, your uh, status for this folder to public. And now we're gonna create a new program. 
And here's the, here's the scheme I would like you to use. Use the first seven letters of your last name, a two-digit chapter number, and the problem we're going to do is from chapter 03, a P, which stands for problem, and would you believe I've already forgotten what problem number this is? I believe it's 19. Yes, 19. Okay, so the first seven letters of your last name, and there's nothing magic about the number seven. I could have, you know, allowed for more there. A two-digit chapter number, the letter P for problem, and then a two-digit problem number. Okay, and then when you click create, this will create a brand new program that looks like this. Now, I am not assuming any uh, previous experience with GlowScript. So if this is new for you, just type what I type, okay? <laughs> type what I type. Uh, and it's very important not to alter that first number there. Okay, leave that first, I'm sorry, that first line, leave that first line as it is, or you could seriously break something, okay? So the first thing we're gonna wanna do to work this problem is we're gonna want to define some variables. So uh, we have two planets here. So I'm gonna call, I'm gonna create a, a, a variable called M1, and I'm gonna set it equal to four, times 10 to the 24th. And I like to put my unit uh, as a comment at the end of the line there. I ask my students to include units this way. And uh, I'm going to call the second mass, well, I'm gonna call it M2. And we're gonna create a variable for that. Okay. And let's see, I need an equal sign like that. And we have two position vectors here. I'm going to call them R1 and R2. And I'm going to create vector R1, 5e to the 11th, negative 2e to the 11th, 0. And that's going to be in units of meters. And you can probably guess what we're going to call the second vector. And I'm using variable names that reflect the notation in the book. So I'm not just randomly making up these variable names. There's actually a, a pattern to them. Uh, let's see, this, the second uh, planet is, or excuse me, the star is at negative 2, times 10 to the 11th, 3, E11, zero. Okay, now we are not going to draw a diagram in this thing. Okay, so we're going to skip that part. But we are going to do part A. And I'm just going to uh, put a comment there to let me know that we are doing uh, part A. So in part A, it says, what is the relative position vector pointing from the planet to the star? Okay, so in matter and interactions, this is called uh, the R vector. And up here, I need to also, uh, I'm going to, I'm just going to very quickly rearrange some of my variables up here. Um, I'm going to organize them by object so that uh, subscript one refers to the planet. And I'm just going to say that subscript two refers to the star. Okay. So what we're asked for here is the position from the planet to the star. Now, the way I teach this may be a little different from the way you teach it, but I teach students to say the position of the planet relative to the star. Question? How did you move? How did you move your lines? 
uh, highlight, cut and paste with my keyboard. Oh, it was just a cut and paste. Okay, thanks. It's just a cut and paste with the keyboard. I All your standard. You drag it. Uh, you know, I've never tried that. It might work, but I've never tried it. I, I'm, I'm, I'm working with a keyboard here that's out of the view of the camera. Okay, so if if we want the uh, the position, it says pointing from the planet to the star. That's the position of the star relative to the planet. So that means R2 minus R1. And it turns out that that is all we have to do for part A. Now, this is another very cool thing about the computation here. We're manipulating vectors in a coordinate free way, the way they're intended to be used. But it's something that uh, you can't do with a traditional calculator, at least it's not easy. Now, just in case you want to see what this, this, this variable R now contains, we can do a print statement and we can say print R equals And when we run our program, it will print that for us, okay? So there's what my code looks like, okay? So this is part A. And now when everybody gets to this point, we're gonna go back to Overleaf and we're gonna begin writing this up. Okay. So just let me know when you've got this, this much right here, and we how will... Did, how did you show your print statement? Right here? Yeah, you showed right. something. You have, oh, to, oh, right. you have to run the program to execute oh, okay. that, and that's what, that's what it will produce. Okay, thanks. So we're letting GlowScript crunch the numbers for us. And the cool thing about that is we can manipulate vectors symbolically. That's, that's, a, that's a very powerful, uh, that's a very powerful notion there. Okay, are we ready to write this up? Okay, so let's go back to Overleaf. I'm gonna go back out to my dashboard, okay? This is my Mandy 300 project. What we're going to do now is we are gonna clone this project. We're not gonna touch this original. It is our template that we are gonna clone. So if you come over here to the right, one of the little icons there is copy. So we are gonna create a copy of this project, but we are going to name it according to our little naming scheme. So you're gonna use the first seven digits of the first seven letters of your last name, a two digit chapter number, a P for problem, and a two digit problem number. And please understand this is arbitrary, but I'll tell you why I have students do this. As we progress through the semester, they are basically building a library, an organized library of problem solutions that they can basically find any problem that they have done whenever they want it and they have a permanent record of it here. And when you create that new project, it brings along those four files that we uploaded into that project. And now we are ready to start writing. Out of curiosity, huh? um, when you use this, I, what I foresee is because this is all digital, it's all filed, it's all very nicely packaged. Uh -huh. How do you prevent students from just handing out the solutions to the problems to the students from the next semester? Like to, by handing over the files, that's all they would have to do. I can't. Okay. Now, um, I have some sneaky ideas involving watermarks. 
uh, that I'm going to experiment with over the summer. But the bottom line is I can't. Okay. Just like I can't prevent them from going to Chegg. I've given up. Maybe rotate problems that you assign from one. And to and that is semester. that is right now. That's what I'm doing. Yes, I do change the problems from semester to semester. Yes. Yes. Yeah, I have a quick question, Joe. Yeah. I I was I was lagging behind on on the the cloning process. Yeah. Okay. So you go back out to your dashboard. Yeah. And we're gonna find this Mandy three hundred project. And we're just going to come over here and we're going to select the copy option right there. Tony, there's there's next to the menu, there's an arrow pointing up. That's what you click to go up a, a, a level, I believe. And that's where you can see your files and start the cloning process. Okay, yeah, right here. If I see the Mandy for sure. Then what, what should I do? Like click okay. on? So over to the far right, there are four little icons. Uh -huh. the, one, the one the the one on the left, uh, the first one on the left is if you hover over it, it says copy. Okay, cool. And you just click on that, and you can and and then write your, the new name. Yep. Cool. I'm gonna do exactly that. Okay. So now you know immediately from the title of this project that this is chapter three, problem 19. And now you know what this NNNNNNNNCCP XX stands for. That is the first seven digits of the student's last name, a two digit chapter number, E for problem, and a two digit problem number. And let's see, there was something else there. Let's see, someone asked me to make this larger. Uh, okay, let me see. D do you mean the view or just the, 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 the text font? Well, I can make the browser window bigger. I can also make the, the, the text bigger. Rosen, which, uh, which which did you want me to make bigger? Like that. I don't, I'm not getting a response, so I assume that's okay. All right. Okay. We ready to start typing? Okay, so here's what we're gonna do first. We're gonna come right here and uh, that little double arrow, we're gonna go full screen with our code. And we are going to uh, fill in a couple of things here. First of all, we're gonna select assignment title. And uh, you know, this is, not very creative, but I'm just going to say chapter three, problem 19. Okay, and that is on line 62 of the uh, of the of the tech file. And on line 63, type your name. Replace the words your name with your name. I do occasionally get a smart aleck student who leaves it as your name, but I think most of them understand that I really want their name there, okay? Uh, don't mess with anything above this little block of code here because you could break the world if you do. <laughs> now, some students have figured out how to, how to ma manipulate this stuff up here, but I'm not gonna go into that right now, okay? All right, we're gonna come right here and notice that we have a begin physics problem. Hmm, that suggests that maybe this is where we should start typing, okay? So right here where it says problem title here, I'm gonna replace that with chapter three, problem 19. 
Okay. And then after that, there's a block of text. And we're just going to delete that block of text because we're going to put something new there. Okay. Now, what I'm about to show you next is the coolest part. And remember, I'm going to say that about everything that I show you here. But here's what I would like you to do. We're going to start typing this problem statement. Okay. So we're going to say a planet of mass. Now watch what happens. We're not going to type four times 10 to the 24th kilograms. Here's what we're going to do. We're going to do backslash mass. Now watch how I do this. Four times 10 to 24. And notice that the 24 is in curly braces. And notice that you have to pair your curly braces. That is the number one mistake that people make. This is unfortunately very akin to C++. You must pair your curly braces. Okay. Is at location. Now we've got a number here. Now this time it's, 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 it's a bigger problem because we have a vector. So watch what we do here. We're going to do backslash. And we're going to type displacement vector because that's what kind of vector this is. And now we're going to type 5 times 10 to the 11th, comma, negative 2 times 10 to 11th, comma, 0. Now let me just ask you all here. What do you think the command times 10 to does? If you the times type, 10 to a power. Yeah, this is going to typeset scientific notation for us. This is going to blow you away when, when you see this. Okay. And now, I, I want to I want to compile this because I want you to see what what this little bit does here. So I'm going to go over there and I'm going to click recompile. And uh, this this particular processor does take a little bit. Okay, so notice that now we have a problem title, chapter three, problem nineteen. There's my name. The date will happen automatically. So every solution is timestamped. This line right here uh, is for my purposes. If somebody asks me a question, I need to know what version of Mandy you're using. So that's a little debug thing there for me. Now scroll down and look right here. Look how beautiful that is. And that's beautiful because we, did, we don't have to worry about units. Okay, let me go full screen with this. You don't, we, no, lo, no longer will students forget units because Mandy knows the SI unit for every quantity defined in their textbook. That's the magic that's happening behind the scenes here. So as long as they know they need a mass, all they have to say is backslash mass and put that number in curly braces. Notice that it typeset this as a vector and, and the angle bracket notation here is identical to what they see in matter and interactions. And I also note that uh, bracket notation is used in many calculus textbooks. So they're gonna be familiar with this notation. Okay. This is cool. Okay. And this one line right there does that. Okay, now uh, I'm not gonna write the second sentence because it's essentially identical to this. It's just that the numbers are different. If you absolutely insist, I will do it, but I wanna show you how to, uh, how to do the, the rest of the solution at this point. Okay, now a little bit of structural uh, 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 issue here. There is a begin physics problem. 
somewhere down here, there better be an end physics problem. And there it is on line 98. Okay, your begins and ends must be matched. That is a fundamental rule in LaTeX. And the technical terminology for this is an environment. So I have created a physics problem environment. In this particular case, this problem has multiple parts. So I have created a parts environment. Notice that there is a begin parts. There better be an end part. There it is on 94. They must be matched. Right there, it says blah, blah, blah. Let's delete the blah, 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 and let's replace it with what is the relative? Now, I'm, just, I'm literally just typing the text of the problem here. I'm, I'm typing part A. And notice, I don't have to tell it that it's part A. LaTeX handles that for us. We don't have to keep track of that. So I'm going to type, what is the relative position vector? Now watch how I get that vector symbol there. We're going to go into math mode with a backslash left parenthesis. We're going to do backslash vec star, and we're going to put an R in curly braces, and then we're going to close math mode. Now, the way LaTeX is designed, there is text mode and there is math mode. If you're writing a line of text like this, you need to explicitly go into math mode with backslash left parenthesis, and you need to close math mode with backslash right parenthesis. Okay. And what do you think backslash vet star does? Just if you had to take a wild guess based on what the book shows, what do you think that command might do? Whoops. It's a vector symbol above R. Oh, wow. That's exactly <laughs> right. See, a lot of this is very logical if you're in the correct state of mind here. So I'm just going to finish typing that sentence. Okay. And at the end of that sentence, if you want to see the result of this line, all you have to do is go back and just recompile. Okay. Now, LaTeX has a built in VEC command. I have altered it. Okay. And if you want to, if you want to be daring, leave out the star in the vec star command and watch what happens. That will actually give bold face for the vectors. I've made that the default because I'm on a mission to get rid of the arrow above the letters. Because that was invented for writing on boards. And with everything, with more and more being done with document oriented solutions like this, I think it's time to retire the arrow. In, in, in vector notation, and you don't see it in, in upper level sources anyway. So I made it a little harder to get to by putting that star there, but there's your, there's your vector notation. By the way, if you hover over that green bar up there, you'll get uh, a zoom tool that you can use to zoom in on your document. Okay. Now we're gonna write up the solution. To this. Okay, so let me show you how we're going to do this. We're going to go inside the physics solution environment. And here's the most important thing you need to remember about the physics solution environment. This is where all of the mathematical content goes. If the, uh, if the, if the question being asked doesn't require any mathematical content, and, and by mathematical content, I'm, I mean a step-by-step -step solution, okay? You don't need the physics solution environment. You can just type the answer.
Okay, but now in this case, we've actually got to do some calculations. So we, we're gonna have to come down inside our begin solution environment. Okay, so we want to, now this is where uh, we would, uh, we're basically doing the written solution at this point. And I tell students to go ahead and write their solutions out by hand uh, because I find that that helps them organize their thoughts. So what I'm gonna do here I'm going to say vec r, and I'm going to put ampersand equal sign. I'll, I'll explain what the ampersand is for in just a moment. And now I'm going to come up here, and we're going to copy and paste our vectors from the problem statement. Now, I noticed that I only typed one of them, OK? Uh, it looks like we probably should have typed that second sentence after all. But basically, you can just copy and put that right there. And notice uh, we actually need to do, we've got to do a subtraction here. So we need the other one. So just looking at the book here, the other one is displacement. And we've got slightly different numbers here, negative two times 10 to the 11th comma three times 10 to the 11th. And the Z component is zero, okay? Now, I may have put those there in the wrong order. I'll fix that in a moment. And the editor should wrap your line automatically. So you don't hit return at the end of a line. Okay. Now, how many of you have tried to get students to show their work one step at a time and offer a reason for them, a reason for each step in the process? I have tried that in the past with paper and pencil. And for some reason, believe it or not, students simply resist doing it. But here they have no choice. They have to use a reason command at the end of each line. Okay, so So what we basically just did here is the justification for this step is this is the definition of relative position vector. And let me make that a little, let me zoom out there a little bit. Okay, so there's my entire line. Okay, and notice that when I'm, when I've written that second vector, I do backslash reason and then in the curly braces, I put my reason and okay. Now, at the end of this line, we're going to open up a brand new line and we're going to do this. We're going to type ampersand equals. Now, this is where we have to go back to glow script and actually get the answer. Okay. So if you run your glow script program, you can literally copy those three numbers right there. And I'm going to come back here. Let's see. When you subtract two displacement vectors, what do you get? Another vector. Displacement. You get another vector, exactly. So you know, and look at that, the editor already knows the command. This is a very smart editor. Now, I'm gonna paste those in, but notice that we need to doctor them up a little bit. We need to replace the E with a times 10 to, and the exponent needs to be inside the curly braces, okay? Okay. 
And I reasoned, well, this is the answer. You, get a, you need to change an S to a T. You got tin so instead of tin two in the second one. Oh, thank you. That would have thrown an error. Thank you. And I need to spell answer correctly. Okay. Now, I'm not going to put two backslashes at the end of this line. And this is one of those things that's kind of difficult to remember. The last line of a physics solution environment does not take double backslashes. And the reason for that is it will introduce an empty numbered step in your display. Okay. So when you get to this point, hit your recompile button and prepare to be astounded. I confidently say in the hopes that nothing goes wrong. <laughs> it's just been one of those weeks here. So uh, let me, let's see, I seem to have lost my, uh, there we go. Uh, okay, so how do I, there we go, okay. So I'm gonna go out of full screen and I'm gonna hit my uh, recompile button over here. And by the way, you can have uh, the compiler working as you type. I find that to be supremely uh, annoying. Uh, so I have that turned off and you can toggle right here. If you click on this little disclosure arrow, you can turn off auto compile. But look at, look at this, look at this, look at this. How gorgeous that is. No more decoding, handwriting. Those days are over. No more having to remember the unit. Now you might think, well, I want my students to remember the units. Trust me, they will. They will, they will see the units so often that they will learn the units, okay? And notice that everyone is using the same notation. We're very close to Nirvana. And look at this, each step is numbered. So now, and this just happens automatically. This is the way I've defined the physics solution environment. Each step is numbered. And the numbering will happen continually no matter how many parts there are. Notice we didn't have to tell it part A or part B. LaTeX figured that out. Notice it formatted the numbers for us. Notice it wrapped that long reason for step number one. This would not have been possible with paper and pencil. This was not, this is what we wanted, but let's be honest, this was not possible with paper and pencil. Okay. Let's do part B. Let's do part B. Let's go back to Glow Script. Part B. I'm so excited now, I'm typing too fast. Part B, okay. Part B says, what is the distance between the planet and the star? Okay, so basically what we want is the magnitude of that R vector, okay? So I'm gonna create a variable called R mag. And in GlowScript, that's all we have to do. There's this, there's part B. And let's we're gonna print it out just to be reassured that the computer did it. And again, I'm I'm going through this faster. I'm not explaining what the syntax of this print statement is or anything like that. That's a glow script workshop. Okay. And I'm just gonna run this just to verify that it does work. And while I'm here, I'm just gonna copy that number to my clipboard. Because we're gonna grab that number uh, to put into our written solution, okay? And now I'm gonna jump back to my overleaf. And I like to do my coding in full screen like this. Uh, if you if you're okay with a split screen, that's fine. But down here, notice I have a second problem part. 
and I've got blah, blah, blah written there. Well, I'm going to get rid of that blah, blah, blah. And I'm just going to put a note here. Uh, okay. So that's, we need the magnitude of the relative position vector. So then I'm going to come down inside my uh, physics solution environment. And notice that I have a brand new one here. Line 92 is a begin physics solution. Line 94 is my end physics solution. Okay. Now I'm going to show you another, uh, another new math command here. If we want the magnitude of a vector, I have defined a magnitude command. Now, I'll let you I'll let you determine what we do next. At this point, I could we could just state the answer from GlowScript. But if you want your students to show the explicit algebra in calculating the magnitude of this, I will show you how to do it. You tell me. Do you want to, do you, do you want to see the, 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 the math? Or do you want to just rely on GlowScript? Let's see the math. Let's see the math, okay? So how do you calculate the magnitude of a vector? In general, you take the square root of the sum of the squares of the components, right? Okay, so here's how you do this in LaTeX. You first open up a square root function. This will type set a big radical. And now we need to fill in what goes underneath the radical. So here's how we're gonna do this. We're gonna open up empty parentheses. And notice that I'm simply gonna use displacement. I'm not gonna say displacement vector here. I'm gonna simply say displacement. And I'm gonna come up here and I'm gonna grab that X component. And I'm going to you stick just it. lost your value from GlowScript. I'm sorry. You when you did the copy there, you just lost your value from GlowScript that you copied a while ago. I know. I know. Okay. I know. Yeah, I'll have to go back and grab that. Okay. Now I'm going to type a plus. Okay, I've done the X component. Now I'm gonna do the Y component. And I'm gonna come up here and I'm gonna grab that Y component. And I just realized I forgot to do something. I forgot to square that X component, didn't I? So I'm gonna come here after the parenthesis and I'm gonna say caret two. And I'm going to square my Y component. And now, finally, I'm going to. Whoops! I want to. I want to put parentheses around that, and then I'm going to grab. Oh, well, this is easy because the z components are just zero. Okay. Oh, what's our reason for this? Uh, I believe this is just the definition of magnitude. Correct. Now, that's really all there is to this calculation. 
So I'm not going to put double backslashes out at the end because this is the last line of the uh, of, of the solution. And I forgot to square my Z component. So let me go back and put a carrot two right there. OK. Now let's recompile this. And I promise you, you're going to be astounded at the result. Okay, now it looks like we do need one more line to state the final answer, right? So I'm gonna go back to my code. And out here, I am gonna put my, we are gonna add a, another line here. So we need the, we need the final answer. And I'm just gonna do ampersand equals. And now I'm gonna go back to glow script I'm going to run my program and I'm just going to grab that number right there. And I'm going to come back and I'm going to say displacement. And then I'm going to put that number there. And now I'm going to get the uh, scientific notation correctly, and we're done. And I'm not worried about sig figs, okay? I'm not gonna worry about sig figs. If you wanna worry about sig figs, that's fine. Well, my next career is gonna be in radio, so. <laughs> Thank you, Tony. Uh, so now let's go back and, uh, and compile this. And uh, and this could give us our, and look at that, beautiful double bars around our vector magnitude because single bars are an absolute value and that doesn't apply to vectors. This is a different operation and a lot of calc books use the double bars anyway. So by default, I defined the magnitude command to give uh, double bars, okay? Now, you proceed like this through every remaining part of the problem, okay? And, and there are some things that, uh, like for example, I haven't yet shown you how to do fractions. Before we do that, I wanna show you how to make their document talk to GlowScript. So what we are going to do now is I'm gonna show you how to incorporate their program into their document, okay? And this is just breathtakingly simple. Okay, so let's go back to GlowScript. Here's our source code. The first thing we're going to do is we're going to highlight the source code and we're going to copy it to our clipboard. Okay, highlight the source code as is and we're going to copy it to our clipboard. Then we're going to go back into our document and we're going to come down and we're going to look for a glow script block environment and inside that glow script block environment we are simply going to overwrite the existing code that's there and we're going to replace it with the code we just wrote okay and there it is Now, in order to make it clickable, we need to supply a URL. And here's a very cool feature of GlowScript. If you click on share or export this program, as long as it's in a public folder, this link can be given to anyone on the planet and they can see your program. They cannot edit it, but they can see the code and they can run it. Now, I ask students to use a URL shortener, and there are two reasons why I do that. First of all, that hash mark in the URL is going to confuse LaTeX, and it's going to throw an error. The document will still compile, but you're going to get a warning. I don't know what that character means. If we use a URL shortener, 
that issue goes away. Okay, so that's one issue. The other reason I ask students to use a URL shortener is because the URL for their program is literally shorter to deal with. There it is. And notice that I did not include the HTTPS because the URL shortener that I use omits that. I didn't realize that until fairly recently. And so I built that in to the software here. So if you're not using a URL shortener, you don't need to copy or you don't, after you copy this URL into your document, you need to delete the HTTPS slash slash because I provide that for you. Okay. And so now all we have to do is type a caption. So I'm just going to say program for uh, chapter three, problem 19. And if I recompile this, this is, this is one of those magic moments here. If I recompile this, and assuming I haven't, uh, you know, mess something up along the way, at the end of the document, there is the actual program that we used. Clicking anywhere in the gray box will take me to that program. It will take anyone to that program and it will automatically run the program and we can look at the code. It's important that you remember that it is a read-only link, so you cannot alter the student's code. Okay, it's a security measure. Also, at the beginning of your document, you have a hot link that will take you straight to the, the program listing from the table of contents. But they can actually, and, and, and if they email me this document, all I have to do is click anywhere in that gray box and I can see their code. And every problem that requires numerical calculation must include a script, even if it's for something as simple as what we just did. Now, a lot of problems just require uh, text-based answers or uh, algebraic answers. And of course, there's no Glow script required for that. Glow script doesn't do algebra. Um, Joe, Joe, can I ask you a yeah, question? Yeah, yeah. Um, can you go over how you got the shorten the yeah. URL? Yeah, again, please. What I, I use Chrome for a lot of my work now uh, because GlowScript, I don't know if y'all know this or not, but GlowScript actually lives on Google servers. And so the Google uh, infrastructure is built into the workings of GlowScript. And um, I use, that's, that's one reason that I use Chrome. Uh, and so if you go to the Chrome store and look for URL shorteners, you'll find no fewer than a thousand of them. Pick one and use it. I can never remember the name of the one that I used or the one that I got. So I let me pull it up here and I will send you the link for the one that I use. I like it uh, because it lets me configure the form of the URL and it lets me uh, save directly to my uh, clipboard. So let me stick this over in the chat room. Uh, you know, different students use, use, use different ones. Uh, but it, it was an extension though, it, we have yeah, to install yeah, that. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Google used to have a, a built-in uh, URL shortener that you could access from any website, but they shut it down about five years ago. I'm not sure why. Yeah, I, I just uh, missed that part. I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. And and here's the one that I use. Let me let me copy this link here. And don't pay for one. Don't pay for one. Um and you know you can get these for Firefox, you can get them for Safari, 
Uh, they're, they're a dime or dozen, but this one has proven to be very robust and it hasn't failed me yet. And you can actually configure the, uh, the form of the URL. I think I have mine set to use tiny URL, but there's bit.ly, there's Amazon even has a shortener. Uh, there, there are all sorts of, of uh, proprietary and uh, uh, open source URL shorteners out there. But it's important to remember not to include the HTTPS colon slash slash because that is assumed. My um, the glow script block environment adds that on for you. And and if you if you leave it on, if you leave that HTTP part on, uh, that's going to throw an error and LaTeX is going to get confused with that. This is, at least in my humble opinion, this is really amazing. I, I can't wait to try and implement this. This is, I started, this is a complete rewrite of the old version. The old version is still available in Tech Live. Don't use it because it's crap. And here's how I know it's crap. Uh, last July, I recreated an account on Stack Exchange. And believe it or not, the Tech Stack Exchange is the number one resource for tech information on the planet. The problem is the tech, inf the, the tech, I'm sorry, the uh, Stack Exchange infrastructure is rather toxic and hostile to beginners. And I should know because I got kicked out of the physics site several years ago. <laughs> Another story that I'll tell you at a different time. Uh, but all of the tech developers hang out at Stack Exchange. And I, I just bit the bullet and I said, here's the code rip it to shreds and they made me cry. <laughs> I was sitting here bawling like a child, but you know what? The result is a thousand times better. So I spent the I spent my summer last summer starting in July basically rethinking everything from the ground up. And the result is what you see right now. And I can tell you that the code is so much more efficient. Sometimes a good cry is necessary. And when you have a bunch of French and German and Brazilian and, and English developers and, and some Italians too, the Germans and the Italians are particularly harsh and no offense there, my ancestors are German. But let me tell you, the culture is very different. They spare no they don't care if they make you cry. If you ask their advice, they will give you their advice. Okay. And so you just have to bite the bullet because it, it, it does make you better. And, and you know what? I, I shared that with my students because I really think that's sometimes how physics students uh, see the physics classroom environment. They see us as these very tough, no, you must do it this way type of people. And it really made me more empathetic towards the student's perspective, because I considered myself very much a beginner, even though I have been programming in, in, in LaTeX for a number of years, uh, I literally went back to school this past summer. And so everything is much more streamlined now. The code is much more robust. I have a greater understanding of how to uh, design the commands. Uh, so it, it was very much a learning uh, experience for me, but I, I really think that it has made the final product, this, this package, uh, much, much better. And so uh, it's, it's, yeah, I, I appreciate your remark there. It's, it's very painless compared to the old version, and it's much more efficient. Uh, I, I, I would like to just show you the documentation file because the old version's documentation file was 180 pages. The new version, I believe it's 76 pages. So the documentation has been entirely, entirely re, uh, 
re rewritten. So Tony asked here, how long do you take with students in the introduction phase? I typically take one or two class periods to do what we are doing today. Now you may think, gosh, that's a lot. And it is, but I have decided that this is as important as anything else. If students take an English class or a humanities class, they are expected to use APA style in their research papers. I see this is very analogous to that. Uh, so I think it's worth the time. And the students in the end very much agree because if a lot of these students, well, most of these students are going into STEM disciplines and they're gonna to need to see this sooner or later anyway. And they report back to me that when their professors at NC State see that these community college transfer students are using LaTeX, oh my gosh, that's very cool. They actually get to teach their peers at the transfer institutions how to use this. So the students love it. And I have a couple of students this semester who are writing up their calc projects in LaTeX and their calc teachers are coming to me going, oh wow, this is so cool. I didn't know students were doing this. Last year, I had a student who wrote GlowScript programs that created tech files that included Desmos files and screenshots. He was writing programs that wrote other programs that he was using in other tools in his calculus class. Now, he's probably going to become a professional software developer. Okay, so he was the outlier. The general student isn't going to be able to do that. But students go gangbusters with this. So let me just uh, briefly show you the uh, documentation for this, and I'm going to I'm going to bring up another screen here. Uh, the the documentation file <clears throat> has one page devoted to, and I'm having trouble here. Darn it! Just a second. There we go. My Mac desktop didn't want to work. Uh, Oh, wait, hang on a second, I've got to go to a different folder. Um, I have basically created a one page student quick reference. Uh, and so if I can get students to read this one page, uh, I am happy. And I'm just gonna very quickly show you what it is here. This is the, 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 the documentation. Uh, now, this build date is March 18th, but this is version I. This is the version you all are using. And it just happens to be page seven, which is a nice prime number, easy to remember. This is basically everything here that students need to know. And this is what we focus on. Uh, I have a separate little 30 minute introduction to LaTeX that I present. Uh, where we don't focus on anything related to physics, it's just the basics of tech, okay? And it's it's it, it literally is just what they need. How do you get math notation? How do you get subscripts? How do you get superscripts? How do you do fractions? None of that is mentioned in this documentation. Uh, and notice that all of these things are hot linked here. So if they want all the help on the vet command, you can just click on that and that will take you to page 35 and there's everything there is to know about the VET command. Uh, here's the magnitude command and notice that I give examples of usage here. Uh, now, here's the very cool part. Here is the list of every physical quantity that is defined. I literally went through every page in Matter and Interaction, both volumes, and I defined every command in the book. And the SI units are known in three different forms, base units, derived units, and alternate. Alternate is, is the form that's typically used in textbooks. So that's the default. But these can all be changed on the fly. So it knows which quantities can be vectors. For example, magnetic field. We can have a, you can type a scalar magnetic field, a magnitude, or you can make a vector out of it. And the, and the commands are smart. A vector command expects components separated by commas, for example. 
Uh, there's current dense. Everything defined in matter and interactions is here. And if you use a different book, I have a command that lets you define your own quantities. Okay, so you can set up your own quantities. Uh, I sort of use momentum as an example here. So all of these variants are created internally. Most of these, the students never, ever, ever need to know about. So I don't tell them about it. You can access just the units of a quantity, but I don't tell students how to do that. Some of them figure it out by looking at the documentation. Most don't, and that's okay. As long as they know that momentum with a number gives them something like this, and I even made it very flexible. They can say momentum vector, or they can say vector momentum. That was actually a student request. They said, make it so that we can type it either way. Okay. And because of the restructuring of the code, that turned out to be a one line fix in the code. So the, the commands are very intelligent uh, if they're used correctly. And of course, uh, they don't have to know every quantity at the beginning of the semester. Uh, but as they go through the semester, they think, gee, okay, I need angular momentum. What's the command for angular momentum? Oh, it's backslash angular momentum. So there's a semantic, uh, there's a semantic uh, reason for the way the commands are, are named. Uh, I tell students, say what you want and put a backslash in front of it. And there's a 99% chance that it's gonna work. So really, if I can just get students to look at page seven, I'm happy. Now, if you want to see the index, there it is. And every command that is defined in the package is defined there. Okay, But students really don't need to look at that. Some do because they're really interested in this. But most don't. And that's OK. They don't need to. I've been talking for 90 minutes now. Uh, <laughs> and, and there are no complaints. So in fact, there was already a request by Glenda to, to have a continuation on this, so. Okay, oh, and Tony asked you a good question. This is the Mandy PDF file, okay? And for security reasons, Overleaf will no longer let you view external PDF files. So keep a copy of Mandy PDF on your local computer because that's the documentation, okay? Or if you want, you can go back to the GitHub page and get it. And, but and so it's in the GitHub? It's on the GitHub, yeah. It's oh, also in that zip file that you- Oh, it's also on the zip file. It's, it's in that zip file, yeah. And I just have students to upload it just so they'll have it as a backup in case they lose it from the computer. I can say, go to your project and download it from your project, it's there. Uh, now, in the old days, Overleaf let you look at external PDF files. They, they disabled that feature, claiming it was a security risk. I have no idea. I have no knowledge of that issue whatsoever. Uh, but this is the basics of the workflow, okay? So they get a problem. They use GlowScript to do the numerical crunching. They can pull their GlowScript code into their write-up. And the write-up in LaTeX takes the place of the pencil and paper. And then they present this solution to me in an oral form in a 30-minute interview, which has been the subject of a previous uh, meeting here. A, a, a comment and a question. The, uh -huh. the comment is, I think this is a great way for students to show competency and proficiency when it comes, especially in oral um, interviews, because the reasons are what my eyes are going to go to first yes. before I see yes. anything else. And they can't fake it in a discussion. Right. Yeah. And then the, the question is, and it might be a minor point, um, do you see that this helps their scientific vocabulary when they're trying to explain to you during the oral interviews yes. that, you know, they're using correct terms instead yes. of the electric whatever that. or the magnetic whatever. <laughs> yes, because they, I, I had a, a, a very, uh, I had a secret psychological thing going on here. I wanted them to remember those command names. So I gave great thought to the semantics of the commands. And I am seeing that that is carrying over, that they don't mix things up. 
Uh, and some people uh, said, well, you know, they really need to be learning the units. You need to make it so that they can explicitly, that they have to explicitly put the units. But I have seen no evidence that this has harmed their uh, their ability to, to learn the units uh, at all. In fact, I have seen evidence that it helped them because they'll look and say, oh, I thought I was getting something, but I thought I was getting one thing, but those units don't match there. I needed something else. Uh, and so I have not, I've, I, I've not had a problem with them not learning units. And yes, I, I have seen that, seen it help with their vocabulary because they can't fake this when they're presenting the solution. I had a couple students yesterday try to BS their way through it and they just couldn't do it. And John so, just made a comment on, on in the chat that they do, and we can and, require putting them the units in the yes. low script. And code so as well. when I, uh, and I actually started doing this last semester, when we start working with GlowScript on day one, I will say, please put your units in as a comment. Mm -hmm. And so they're getting that reinforcement as well. So I'm finding that this little ecosystem actually, it, I, I'm not harming anything as far as I can tell. So I'm sort of assuming that it's helping them. It, it, I think it's a mechanism to cement the ideas, the physical ideas and the programming ideas. It's, mm -hmm. they, they have to tell a computer what it needs to do from a physical point of view, and then they have yes. to type it and mm -hmm. tell LaTeX how to do it from, mm -hmm. from Mandy's point of view, which I think mm -hmm. is, is only going to help them deepen their understanding. That's that's my philosophy. So I, I again, thank you again for, for mm -hmm. showing us. Um, I, I'm willing to host another one with a continuation, maybe a little more involved in the programming part and how you do that. But if, if you have any suggestions, please, um, you can send us a, a, a reply, either Joe, myself, Tony, anybody, um, uh, on the Slack channel or on the uh, TYC uh, group email and, and let us know what kind of continuation you'd like us to see. I'm, I'm assuming Joe would not mind doing a continuation. We can bribe him if he if he doesn't want to. <laughs> send me some one. Indian food. I live in a place here where there's no Indian food for 50 miles. So send me some Indian food. We'll chip uh, in a ticket for you to come to California. We have some pretty <laughs> good Indian food out here. I'm doing a repeat of this workshop at the uh, upcoming NCS AAPT meeting, which is uh, joint with the Tennessee section. It's going to be held via Zoom. It is free, but you do have to register in order to get the program with the Zoom link in it. Uh, do you have to reasons. be a member of any of those no. sections? Okay. No. No. Could you share that link and maybe we can send it out to the... It'll um, take me a minute to dig it up no, here. No problem. As long as it's not, the deadline is not today, I can send it out with the information. No, 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 no. I think the uh, abstract deadline was today, but um, and and while I'm digging up this link, uh, Alexander has a question. Do you do you have your students create diagrams, animations in GlowScript? Yes, and uh, of course uh, they include that code as well. In fact, uh, some of their problems are pure computational projects. Uh, and so uh, there's 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 no algebra. There's nothing written to be done. Uh, the whole thing involves writing a visualization in, in GlowScript. So I still ask them to create a LaTeX document for that because they will then have a record of it, and they can include explanation if they want to. And some of them have clued into that, and some of them uh, write their explanations as comments in the GlowScript code. Uh, and I have not shown them how to do uh, diagrams. But if you look in the template file that you have, there is, you see that there's a sample image there. And I think I show you how to rotate it. I've had some students see that one line of code in the source document and provide their own document. The students who are tech savvy are going to eat this up and they're going to figure all this stuff out. And they're the ones that I'm not worried about. It's the students like who came to me yesterday saying, I'm in chapter two and I don't know how to do this. Those are the students that I worry about. And thankfully there, there aren't many of them. 
And, and because of those students, do you ever consider maybe having them work in groups where where some of the tech savvy can help maybe the students who are not? You know, that's a good idea. I never thought about that before, uh, but that's a that's a good idea. That's a good idea. That that's how I run my computational projects. Um, a maximum of three students. Uh -huh. um, where where I strongly suggest you know a tech savvy. Uh, uh -huh. a writing savvy and maybe a physics savvy That's a good um, idea. And, I, and they they decide who they want to work with and let me know um, mm -hmm. by by a certain point in the semester that i actually have it as a discussion assignment okay i found the link here uh I'll, I'll put this over in the chat area i think if you just go to ncsaapt.org i think that will take you there it's it's hosted by google I am there. Oh, okay. And uh, just somewhere on there, there's information about the current meeting. Yep. Uh, so I'm going to do a repeat of this workshop and I'm going to do a repeat of the oral interview talk at that meeting as well. Uh, oh, ready? The registration, registration link is. Yep. I'm just going to say the registration is free. Yeah. And it's right above the uh, flower picture. You have to scroll down a little bit to, to see it. And this is going to be joint with Tennessee, which we've never done before. Uh, so we're looking we're looking forward to, to that. Yeah, this Zoom meetings are becoming great. The, the AAPT yeah. section meetings available from North Dakota, you know. It's, yeah, I, I hope they will continue yeah. <laughs> some of this format even after we come back um, into I hope so personal too. meetings but because it's it's they can be focused, thing. they can be yes. open, they can be timely. The past, year, the past year has been terrible, but it's made for wonderful connectivity uh, opportunities. Uh, so I, I hope this will continue as well. So your assignment is to do the rest of the problem parts <laughs> and email me your completed PDF. <laughs> well, oh, by the way, I am I am working on a book uh, on introduction to LaTeX for for physics teachers and physics students. That is going to be my next book project. Will it have a chapter on including glow script in it? Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, John, will, you have your will, will there be an oral presentation of our homework at the next uh, at the next APT meeting? Yes, I'll send out the Google form and you can sign up for your appointment. Which reminds me, I need to post the new Google thing for next week's appointment. Oh, I'm behind. <laughs> Any question? Thank you so much, Joe. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Um, thank we'll you. open it for questions. I don't have a time limit for the meeting. So um, if anybody's willing to stay and if Joe is willing to stay, we, we can take this as long as we want. David. Got nowhere to go. It's a little bit tangential, but um, are you guys saying that you do, um, with GlowScript, you do numerical calculations like solving differential equations, solving like equations of motion numerically? Yes. I, are, are you familiar with uh, matter and interactions? A little bit. And, okay. and I'm a little bit familiar with GlowScript from one of the, I did one of your workshops in okay. the past, but I, I so, got hung up at the point of doing the numerical. Code. Okay. So let me, I'm going to tell you in very technical terms what we do. We solve second order linear differential equations by re rewriting them as a system of two first order linear differential equations. Basically, <laughs> now students sort of glaze over when I say that. We, we, uh, we use, we numerically solve differential equations to, uh, for example, numerically integrate the, uh, the motion of a planet around a star uh, to integrate the motion of a spring. Now the book doesn't call it what I just said. The book calls it, oh, we're gonna use the momentum principle and we're gonna use a iterative solution here. So, uh, the, the momentum principle is the matter and interactions term for Newton's second law written as DPDT. 
So in that sense, yes, we do solve differential equations. I don't start telling students that at the beginning because I'm afraid it might freak them out. But but ultimately, yes, that's what we do. Do you have um, do you import some numerical programs, or do you have the, do you have them write out like uh, Runga Kutta steps or something? Or no, 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 no. Everything is in the book. Everything is in the book. It's a simple Euler Cromer scheme uh, with. Uh, we, the, the, the most we do is experiment with the size of the time step. Uh, and this is presented as the power method for solving uh, Newton's laws problems where the force is varying and it could vary in terms of, of course, magnitude and direction. Uh, so we first look at spring systems and then we look at uh, gravitational motion in second semester, we look at uh, the motion of charged particles in electromagnetic fields. If we get that far this semester, I'm so far behind, it's ridiculous. Uh, but yes, we do things that require visualizations. Uh, we do things that require numerical solutions, but to help with buy-in, I tell them we're gonna begin with using GlowScript as a replacement for the calculator. Because remember, for every problem they do, they have a record of that solution on the GlowScript server. So they're building up a library of things that they can use and then reuse when they need to in, in, in the future. Um, Joe, correct me if I'm wrong, but there, there is a um, collection of the codes used in matter and interaction on GlowScript. Am I correct? Yeah, there's a whole, there's a whole, uh, yeah, sure. There's a demo. So when you go into GlowScript, if you go, if you click on examples, uh, if you click on, let's see. Uh, uh, GlowScript, and down here, if you click on example programs, and you go into the matter interactions tab, and you run this, Here's a menu of all the interactive uh, demos. Some are more interactive than other. Now these are demos. These are more complicated than what students would be asked to do, for example. So for example, uh, here's a double pendulum. Uh, and some of these use uh, Lagrangian solutions. Uh, but this, is, this is far beyond what a student would be expected to do. But uh, you could give them this, for example, as a a lab activity of some sort and have them do something with it. Uh, just yesterday, we were looking at a program that shows uh, surface charge distribution on a conducting block. This was actually, this was actually written up as a paper in AJP by uh, Sherwood and Shabai. Uh, and this is an actual numerically derived uh, charge distribution uh, students don't have access to the program that generated this, but this is all, I don't know if you noticed that, but it was reading in a data file at the beginning. It was reading in the data file uh, with all the numbers for, uh, for plotting this charge distribution here. Uh, red is positive, blue is negative, and you can sample the space around this and, and look at the electric fields around here. So, uh, yeah, there's, there's a ton of demos here for Matter and Interactions. And if you go to matterandinteractions.org, there are links to even more demos. Thank you. It's a very rich self-contained curriculum. I know Michael has used it, I think, and I know Tony has used it. Uh, so yes, very, very rich, uh, very rich content there. And it's a great way to introduce students to how computation can be used in physics without it being a computational physics course. Mm -hmm. And I gave a talk in Washington, D.C. a few summers ago about how LaTeX might be an interesting gateway into computation just itself, just in creating a document. Uh, because you, you still have to think logically about how you structure the document. Uh, you have to, 
you know, you, you can focus more on the content than the, like, for example, we didn't have to worry about margins. We didn't have to worry about font size or anything like that. That's because LaTeX handles all that for you. So students can, can think about the content and how to present that content to show that they've actually learned something. So that's, that's sort of built into to the approach that I'm using here. I was going to say that uh, one of the things that was interesting for me moving to, to California was just the, the sense that uh, modern interactions became an expensive textbook for my students. Uh, and I don't think that they, they can't buy it, but it's just like the culture at my institution was such that they were kind of downsizing on paying uh, for expensive textbooks. Mm -hmm. So I basically couldn't just adopt modern interactions like that. But I actually use some of the content uh, that's related to, obviously my second semester is when I had more time to, to start thinking about how can I really incorporate some of that stuff in. But I know that's, a, that's an interesting thing for us in, in California to think about in terms of, uh, it's, even if it's 79 bucks, it's still expensive, you know, so. And uh, the fifth edition is in, is in preparation. I haven't heard anything about a release date, but uh, that may mean that the fourth edition might become a little more affordable. Uh, I don't know what affordable here is. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I tried to get some money to buy one classroom set. I mean, that didn't come out correct. To get enough for an entire classroom. So my, my classes are capped at 24. So that would have been 48 books, volume one and volume two. And first we, was, we were told that, yes, there's money there. And then, of course, at the end, we were told, no, there's no money there. Uh, so I've even started about uh, thought about starting a GoFundMe to see if I can, you know, just get 24 copies of, of, of the text I have. And then we could zero out the textbook on the on the uh, on the course requirement list and students. Wow, here's a physics course. We don't have to buy anything. Mm -hmm. Instructor provides everything for us. That'd be cool. We need a couple of three thousand dollars for that. And I was going to use the royalties from my astronomy book. To do that, but it turns out that there was not enough there, <laughs> which I don't know whether to be happy or bad or sad about. Uh, but my astronomy book is published by our publishing house at the school, and so there was a little bit of money in that account. Uh, but it turns out there was not enough there to buy the books. So I'm hoping maybe that when things get back to normal, our president or someone can scrape up enough money to buy a set of books just to keep in the classroom that students can refer to. Any other questions, comments? Well, thank you again, Joe. I, I really learned a lot today and I, I'm sure I'm not the only one, so I appreciate it. And hopefully we'll get enough comments where we can organize a continuation with, with you to, to show us what else and how much more we can do with this. Cause I, I think we only scratched, the, uh, barely scratched the surface. Well, of the just to teach you a little bit, what if I told you that it's possible for LaTeX to actually do the number crunching? Yeah. Students can type in an expression, and when they compile their document, out comes the number. That's coming. That's already possible. I haven't shown students how to do it, but that's possible. So LaTeX <laughs> is rapidly becoming a computational environment. Yeah. Now, it's not going to replace Jupyter notebooks or anything like that. But for just calculating forces and things like that, that's coming. That's coming. Great. Great. Any other comments, questions? Thank you, David, for joining us. See you. Thanks a bunch. All righty. Great. So um, I will stop recording. We can stay as long as we want.